Now, I would like to talk about the horseshoe kidney, uh, which is a fun topic and has a lot of interesting angles to it. So uh, today our goal will be to give you a little general overview about horseshoe kidneys. I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar already with them. We'll talk specifically about some critical anatomic features that should be factored into your decision making in treating them. And we'll talk about the special case of the horseshoe kidney in some specific urologic diseases and surgery states. So we'll start off first with a general overview. Remember that horseshoe kidneys are the most common renal fusion anomaly and it's occurring in about one in 400 patients. Uh, these are not ectopic kidneys. So ectopic kidneys are kidneys on the other side of the midline. Um, the most common is a cross-fused ectopic kidney. Again, you see the ureter crossing the midline to its normal location. Um, this is not uh, a horseshoe kidney. Ectopic kidneys come in a variety of flavors. Again, the most common is the cross-fused ectopic kidney. Uh, but these others are much less common and you'll be seen very infrequently in your practice. A horseshoe kidney is uh, not ectopic and about 98% of them have a fusion of the isthmus at the lower pole. I've actually not seen one in the upper pole, but they do exist. We're not going to talk much about embryology, but basically the process of renal development is uh, involved with the notochord and floor plate. These play a critical role in fusion and disruption of these structures during uh, embryologic development results in fusion anomalies. Part of that has to do with a protein called the sonic hedgehog protein, which creates a gradient within the notochord. And if you disrupt this molecularly by uh, inactivating this specifically in the notochord, you don't end up with no kidneys, you end up with a fusion anomaly that looks a lot like a horseshoe kidney. Today, though, we are not going to spend our time talking about molecular biology. We're going to touch mostly on the clinical issues uh, associated with this process. So keep in mind, horseshoe kidneys are generally asymptomatic. So more than 50% of patients that have them are asymptomatic. Even back in the 1950s, before patients were getting routine abdominal ultrasounds, patients followed for more than 10 years, the majority were asymptomatic. Also keep in mind that even when the anatomic features look very dramatic, such as hydronephrosis, they may not be functionally relevant. So let's keep in mind that even though it may look like a duck, it may not be a duck in the case of the horseshoe kidney. So watch out for that anatomic functional correlation. This is that study from the 1950s. I, I love the fact that you could follow 50 patients by yourself for 10 years and get it into the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and, but they followed these 51 patients Almost 60% remained completely asymptomatic through the 10 years. A few of them had recurrent infections, a few had episodes of pain, and about a little less than 20% had symptomatic stones. So about double the general population. So horseshoe kidneys that are symptomatic, generally they're related to hydronephrosis, infections, or stones. Um, they quote about 30% of patients having recurrent urinary tract infections, and a higher proportion have stones than the general population. The real number is a little unclear. It's probably somewhere between 20 and 50%. That classic constellation of symptoms that we see with horseshoe kidneys, which would be that vague abdominal pain radiating to the lower back, nausea and vomiting, that tends to be worsened by hyperextension of the spine. This is sort of the classic Campbell's uh, description. Uh, is relatively uncommon, <clears throat> and it doesn't appear to be resolved by division of the isthmus, so it's not just purely a compression issue. Horseshoe kidneys are outside the pelvic inlet, and so they don't inf uh, confer an increased risk during pregnancy uh, or delivery, and they don't appear to have a higher progression to renal insufficiency. So let's talk about the meat of the matter, which is these critical anatomic features that you should keep in the back of your mind when you see a patient with horseshoe kidneys. Um, the first feature is that uh, there's a relationship in general to the horseshoe kidney isthmus with the inferior mesenteric artery. And renal ascent uh, is stopped by the junction of the aorta and the inferior mesenteric artery. This is the traditional teaching. And these kidneys are generally lower in the abdomen. So you can see where the aorta is, and here's the IMA, and, and we're taught that the kidney rises and gets stuck at the IMA. And that's true in some cases. The truth, though, <clears throat> is that these kidneys are lower than normal in only about 60% of cases, and only about 40% of them are stuck at the IMA. So it's not a 100% like we sometimes are taught. 
Um, it, that necessitates some trocar shifting when you're doing laparoscopy. So if we're dealing with a standard kidney doing a straight laparoscopic procedure, we might have something like this. But because the kidney's lower, you're going to want to shift your ports away uh, from the umbilicus to provide access to a lower region of the abdomen. Our second feature is that they have anteriorly oriented renal pelvis and ureters. Um, that actually can be to your advantage for various surgical approaches to the horseshoe kidney, um, such as approaches for pyeloplasty or for pyelolithotomy. Very rarely, the isthmus can be behind the great vessels. Again, I have not seen one of those, but it's important to review your CT scan before treating these patients to assure that you're not a lucky person that had one. Third critical feature is one that always impacts our decision making, which is the multiple renal vessels that serve horseshoe kidneys. About 70% of them have multiple renal vessels, and there's a lot of variability in where those vessels are located. And remember that the isthmus can be a problem in this case, and that the isthmus can receive blood supply from the aorta, the IMA, the common or external iliac, or even sacral arteries. So uh, again, here's our isthmus, and there's the IMA. Danger if you don't anticipate this. So here's an example of a patient that has four renal arteries serving their right moiety and three serving their left moiety. And you can see an artery down here specifically coming from the common iliac to the lower pole of the right moiety. So this is a little bit of a danger spot if you don't anticipate that when you're operating on these kidneys. Also watch out for direct arteries passing directly into the isthmus behind from the aorta. These are tricky if you're dealing with this during a a division of the isthmus. This is a retrospective CTA study published in 2019 looking at a, a normal kidneys and horseshoe kidneys. And the take home message is that horseshoe kidneys generally have smaller arteries, more arteries, and arteries that arise lower in the abdomen. So if you look at the normal kidneys, none of them had arteries going to the, the kidney from the common iliac or, or distal whereas in the horseshoe kidneys, there were a substantial number that did. So here's an example of some tricky vascular anatomy, and we'll touch on this case at the end of the talk. Uh, but here's an example of a horseshoe kidney. It has a modest isthmus, and you can see this is the inferior mesenteric artery, and that's a branch off the inferior mesenteric artery that's going directly to the lower pole of the left kidney. So here we are. Uh, we'll explain why we're doing all this later. But this is the lower pole of the left moiety. This is the branch from the IMA, which is here going down. There's the IMA. There's the branch going to the lower pole. So a little bit of a tricky situation. Our fourth critical feature is that there's a lot of variability in the size of the isthmus uh, and whether or not there's collecting system within the isthmus, which is a critical element. The isthmus is usually fairly bulky and down at the L3 or L4 level, but that's not always the case. Occasionally, it can be a thin, fibrous band like it is in this picture. Keep in mind that, uh, sorry, when you do this, that there's a midline fusion and a lateral fusion flavor of horseshoe kidneys. About 40% are midline fusions, meaning that they're very symmetrical. The collecting systems do not cross the midline. But uh, almost 60% can have lateral fusion, where the collecting system crosses the midline, and actually the fusion is not in the midline. This is an important issue when doing surgery to remove one of these moieties. So here's an example of that uh, recently published uh, complication where they did a laparoscopic right nephrectomy. Uh, and what they did was they took, the, it, they took what they thought was the isthmus right in the midline, and that resulted in a persistent problematic urine leak because the fusion was to the left of the midline. And actually, it looks very obvious when you look at it open, but they left a portion of the lower pole that was still perfused and was leaking urine into the abdomen. Fifth feature is that uh, we have to remember that these kidneys do not rotate completely anteromedially like they would in a, a normal kidney, and this results in a different access. So again, normal kidneys and horseshoe kidneys have a different access, and that plays some role in uh, percutaneous access. Horseshoe kidneys have the same number of calyces uh, as normal kidneys, but they are generally atypical in orientation. So this is a horseshoe kidney, looks very strange. Uh, it has the same number of calyxes, but just oriented differently. And then finally, there's a, usually a high, or maybe a high insertion of the ureter into the renal pelvis, uh, although the lower ureter usually enters the bladder normally. All right, so what does all that do to our surgical planning uh, when we face one of these patients? 
So let's talk first about stones. So we know that kidney stones are caused by lots of factors. There are genetic factors, there are metabolic factors, there are dietary factors, and then there are some anatomic factors. In the case of the horseshoe kidney, the perhaps increased risk of urinary tract infections might contribute to stone disease, and this issue of poor drainage related to the high insertion of the ureter and the anterior location of the pelvis and ureter uh, might create stasis and increase the risk of stones. So when we're faced with stones in the horseshoe kidney, let's think about those critical features. So the kidneys are lower in the abdomen. That may impact on your ability to target them with shockwave lithotripsy, uh, although generally it is possible to do so. Um, occasionally they may require prone piece, uh, S wall to address those stones. They have this high insertion and these issues of drainage. This can have an impact on ureteroscopy that can make angles to the lower pole and uh, collecting system within the isthmus difficult, and it can affect your percutaneous access, again, because they're lower and have a different angle of approach. Keep in mind that any modality that leaves a bunch of fragments behind in a horseshoe kidney may be suboptimal because of that suboptimal drainage. So the traditional teaching was that you addressed stones less than one and a half centimeters with shockwave lithotripsy and horseshoe kidneys, and then everybody else got percutaneous surgery. Your rheurospy really wasn't on the table, but that's changed a fair bit. If you look at the shockwave lithotripsy data, this is from 2013, stone-free rates are not very good, about 60%, again, because of this issue of drainage and poor access to the lower pole, and the retreatment rate was about 60%. So these are not great numbers uh, for shockwave lithotripsy, again, because of the drainage issue. PCNL, lots of studies looking at PCNL and horseshoe kidneys. The take-home message is basically that stone clearance rates are generally equivalent to those in normal kidneys. Keep in mind, however, that percutaneous access may be more technically difficult in uh, horseshoe kidneys due to malrotation. Almost all of them require upper pole posterior caosal access. For upper pole posterior caosal access, generally they're not very difficult. Um, but lower pole access can be problematic or sometimes impossible in the horseshoe kidney. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is the kidneys are lower, so your risk of pneumothorax from upper pole access is probably lower. The bad news is because of their location, you really have to be careful of other anatomic structures that may be in the way, such as a retrorenal colon. So very critical to have a CT scan in all these patients before you would contemplate percutaneous treatment. Again, multiple vessels uh, in the horseshoe kidney may complicate access, but generally that complication is only uh, going to affect you in the lower pole. It's not something that affects you uh, when you do your upper pole access. Um, so again, posterior vessels in the isthmus really preclude access there. If you're going to try to do a lower pole access into the horseshoe kidney, you need a good quality CT or maybe even a CT angiogram before doing that. Um, bleeding risk does not seem to be significantly increased in horseshoe kidneys with PCNL, again, because of the medial access uh, points of these vessels, but most of the time that's because you're dealing with upper pole access. And I'll just go back to that example again. So if you've got stuff crossing at the isthmus uh, collecting system, that's going to be a problem for percutaneous access down into that lower pole. Um, sometimes the access tracts can be very long in PCNLs in uh, horseshoe kidneys. Um, you may need a long nephroscope. The truth of the matter is that for most patients, you can get away with standard instrumentation. The current uh, nephroscopes are 23 centimeters, so usually that's adequate to get to them. But it can be a long access tract. So I would say that uh, we also need to think a little bit about ureteroscopy in these patients. Uh, as the technology has gotten better over the last several decades, it's becoming more applicable to the horseshoe kidney. Um, it can be technically challenging, again, because of the high insertion and that that atypical uh, rotation of the calyces. Not all the calyces can be accessed in some of these pa patients ureteroscopically, and stage procedures are still common. Uh, if we look at what's out there in the literature, it's generally fairly favorable. This is a fairly small study, but it had a stone-free rate of 88% without major complications, and on average required 1.5 procedures per patient. So again, retreatment rates may be higher in ureteroscopy uh, like they were for shockwave lithotripsy. This is a, a meta-analysis from uh, Crows looking at this. Um, and again, they saw about a 70%, 70 to 80% stone-free rate for stones. Again, some of these are pretty small stones. Um, and a retreatment rate of only 16%. So I think that like the situation in normal kidneys, ureteroscopy generally has a higher stone-free rate than shockwave lithotripsy in these patients, although there can be some technical challenges with the horseshoe kidney. 
So I would include that here. And I think we need to think a little bit also about the role for mini and ultra mini PCNL in these patients. Uh, this may actually be a good target for an ultra or mini PCNL. Uh, we all have heard about UPJ obstruction in horseshoe kidneys. The incidence is, is a little bit higher, maybe 15 to 30 percent, depending on how you define UPJ obstruction. Again, high insertions, low kidneys, multiple vessels can all impact on that. Conventional open management included a dismembered pyoplasty and division of the isthmus and a nephropexy. Most studies suggest that division of the isthmus and nephropexy are not necessary to achieve your goals uh, in the UPJ with the horseshoe kidney. Um, again, in general, we know that pyeloplasty has a much higher rate of success as compared to endopylotomy or uh, in UPJ obstruction. And remember that horseshoe kidneys have lots of extra vessels, so crossing vessels are very common. This is probably not a great setting for the endopylotomy. few tips and tricks, remember lower placement of your trocars. Um, again, you can do transmesenteric access in a thin person with a horseshoe kidney that can be beneficial. That CT needs to be a good quality image and ideally a CT angiogram for these patients just so you know what you're up against when you get in there with the multiple vessels and potential crossing vessels. And again, spread out your trocars. Depending on how you're doing this robotically, laparoscopically, uh, it can be important to avoid uh, cramping when you're dealing with the lower abdomen. This is just a quick case example, 31-year-old woman with uh, right upper quadrant pain, very large renal pelvic stone and a UPJ obstruction. You can see the horseshoe kidney here, um, no prior surgery. Again, a robotic pyeloplasty removed the five centimeter stone, multiple aberrant vessels and high insertion, but this is all very manageable using normal pyeloplasty techniques. Nice uh, outcome in terms of uh, cosmetics and good long-term outcome. All right, last couple of things. We'll talk a bit about hemi-nephrectomy. So again, and in some cases, you're gonna to need to remove one of these kidneys or perhaps mobilize it for partial nephrectomy. Um, and it's important to be able to address the isthmus, which you may have to divide. Again, be careful of, of the uh, short arteries feeding the isthmus from behind and make sure that you anticipate and control multiple vessels. Um, it's a little bit of a skill set of fusion between sort of donor nephrectomy skills and uh, robotic or laparoscopic partial nephrectomy skills. Because this idea of just crawling up the great vessels under the ureter that we are taught for doing laparoscopic nephrectomy often isn't feasible in the horseshoe kidney and we have to go from a top-down approach, which is more common in the donor nephrectomy setting. Um, when you're dealing with the isthmus, there are lots of approaches for doing that. If it's a thin fibrous isthmus, you can usually use the harmonic scalpel or the ligature to transect it. You can also staple across one that's uh, medium thickness as long as you know there's no collecting system there. Um, in general, for the thicker isthmus, we'll, we'll essentially use partial nephrectomy approaches and compress that uh, and then transect it. You can use a Satinsky clamp as well to help with hemostasis. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, this is a simple case, 24-year-old patient with sort of a burned out uh, left renal moiety that needed to be removed. Um, and you can see we've elevated that left renal moiety, placed the Satinsky clamp across the healthy portion of the other kidney transected it, nice hemostasis in that situation, and then over -sewed it, and things worked out very nicely. I'm gonna skip that, you can do it. Uh, again, keep in mind that uh, renal cell carcinoma risk is not increased in the horseshoe kidney patient, but often you need to divide the isthmus to access a posterior tumor. An example of that would be here. So in the case of an anterior tumor, we can approach that very nicely from the transperitoneal approach. In the case of a posterior tumor though, trying to flip this over can be very problematic and then sometimes you need to transect the isthmus to do that or what is perhaps a little bit simpler which is just to approach these uh, retroperitoscopically. All right, last little bit, I'm gonna talk about integrating all this information into an example of a, a horseshoe kidney donor. Um, so we know that there's a problem with the number of donor organs out there. Uh, our dialysis patient numbers are growing and our transplant rates are stagnant or relatively uh, decreasing. Uh, lots and lots of patients are dying on the transplant waiting list. In 95, since 95, almost 85,000 patients have died. So we're looking at different ways to expand the donor pool. Again, scary looking uh, waiting list compared to what's actually happening with the transplant. Uh, and if you look at the number of patients on dialysis, it's even scarier. So anything we can do to try to expand the donor pool is very reasonable. Now, all of these factors that I've talked about are relevant to doing a donor nephrectomy in the case of a horseshoe kidney, and we need to factor them in. Um, here's that case I showed you earlier, has that extra vessel coming off the IMA. 
which I showed you earlier. And just to show that we uh, did this using a combination of our standard single site technique and robotics. And just a little bit of this. This is that picture you saw before. We had compressed the parenchyma of the isthmus using uh, clips, just like you would in a partial nephrectomy. And then during the extraction phase, transected the ureter, transected that lower pole vessel. We then stapled across the compressed portion of the isthmus and took the remaining vessels and extracted the kidney. Warm ischemia time was about three and a half minutes in this case. So this is all very doable. So in conclusion, uh, we've given you an overview of uh, horseshoe kidneys in adults. Uh, we've talked a little bit about seven critical anatomic features that you should remember uh, that can impact on disease and treatment. Um, I've given you a broad look at stone disease in horseshoe kidneys and some of the technical considerations that are important. Um, we've touched briefly on UPJ obstruction, although management is fairly standard in those patients. And finally, I've given you some tips and tricks for managing hemi-nephrectomy and isthmus division uh, in the cases of uh, nephrectomy and partial nephrectomy. Thank you very much.